Hi everybody, I'm Kate Hosman from the Delaware Highlands Conservancy uh, and today we're doing a very special video for you guys. Uh, you may or may not know we were going to be having a native plants walk later this week, uh, but unfortunately we are not able to hold that event in person. Uh, but we still felt that it was really important to get out and kind of go through the motions and get a video uh, that would be just as informational and instructive for our viewers. So uh, we're here today at YMCA Camp Spears in Dingman's Ferry, PA. And in addition to myself on this walk, we've got a couple other contributors today, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Hi there, I'm Amanda Subgen. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager with the Delaware Highlands Conservancy. Glad to be back at Camp Spears today to explore the Long Swamp property. And my name is Heather Housekeeper. I'm a local herbalist, uh, often providing edible and medicinal info for the Delaware Highlands Conservancy. And uh, folks like to call me the Botanical Hike. Botanical hiker. So welcome, come along with us today. We're going to socially distance, but we're going to explore different kinds of plant communities and look for some cool wildlife habitat, trees, plants, and other interesting things we find in the woods. John, can you tell us about the history of the camp and how we acquired this easement? Absolutely. In 1989, I had an ecological survey done of Long Swamp by the Nature's Conservancy, and then over the next 20 years was looking for a way to preserve the property. It would turn out that the Highlands Conservancy was the best possible agent because they were able to apply like we could not for these publicly available funds. And quite frankly, in the Great Recession of 2008, the number of campers coming to camp dropped dramatically and we were heading toward bankruptcy. And so by selling the development rights rather than the property itself to development enabled the money to keep camp solvent until it was purchased by the Greater Philadelphia Y. And of course, that's what it is today. It remains a summer camp for the YMCA of Philadelphia. And so the Delaware Highlands Conservancy had access to state funds through the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources and the county funds of Pike County through Scenic Rural Character Preservation Program. That was part of a $10 million bond back in 2000. And we coupled that funding together along with Delaware Highlands Conservancy's staff time and legal counsel to assist the camp at that time to finalized the easement in 2009, formally protecting in perpetuity, which means forever, these 458 acres, including the glacial bog that we are seeing today. Yeah, the preservation of the property, there was a lot of development pressure. The camp needed money, and so there were housing developers, commercial developers coming in here, taking a look at this nearly 500 acres and wanting to develop it. And we were able to forestall that development with the money that you raised. And of course today, its primary purpose isn't that it's preserved in perpetuity, it is, but it also serves as an educational resource for the public and also for the thousands of children that come to camp every year. Mm -hmm. And those purposes of the easement include water resources, so we have this bog that's now not going to be a Home Depot or a housing unit, it's now going to be a bog that can help clean water and the downstream users will be affected by that. In addition, the wildlife habitat here is amazing, that's another main purpose of this easement like you said, education and, re and passive recreation. So the easement allows for people to walk on the public access trail after checking in and going through the proper, um, the proper terms with the camp staff here. And then also all the campers that come. And this will never be anything but woods and trails and maybe a couple little recreational camp out spots. But that's all that's really allowed. That's right. There's got to be campers out there that are going to come to here and see this environmental stewardship and want to make environmental a career. That's what happened to me in 1975 when I first came here. I saw the natural environment undisturbed and decided I should have a career dedicated to preserving places like this. We help both the public and children that come through here every year get that same environmental ethos and maybe drive themselves to preserve property like this elsewhere in the country. Thank you, John, for all your hard work to get this easement accomplished. Oh, and thank you. Without the Highlands Conservancy, we would never have been able to raise the money and save this property. So the terms bog, swamp, and marsh are not interchangeable. They're all wetlands, but a marsh is dominated by herbaceous plants, grasses, and sedges. And mostly you'll see those down the shore. It doesn't have a lot of woody plants. A swamp does have a lot of woody plants, and technically this is long swamp. But a swamp is normally by running bodies of water, and we're not having a running body of water here. A bog, on the other hand, is an isolated water body, a wetland, that also has woody plants and is very nutrient poor, very waterlogged, and has a lot of peat. And this also has that. So long swamp is technically a swamp, 
but it's also a bog swamp hybrid because bogs are supposed to not have any drainage, but this bog ultimately does drain to Marcel Lake and then ultimately the Delaware River. So here we are in the bog. We think we are seeing a lot of black spruce, which I'm showing you here. They're kind of our prominent trees. And we have cones hanging on at the top. And very top, there are some cones. Which is indicative of black spruce. And so Heather, if you can point out the black spruce bark over here. You can see it has a darker color than red spruce, kind of a gray, black, thin, scaly. So black spruce, we are calling this a black spruce because its feet are in water. So here are my feet next to water. And we are in standing water at the bottom of this glacial bog. So we're going to go with black spruce. One of the coolest parts about being in this glacial bog is how cool it is down here. And it is a really, really cool temperatured place. Um, it is also a place where we can see how acidic the water is uh, from the tannic acid coming out of the trees. And if you can see below me here, the water is almost brown compared to what you would see in the river, which is a lot lighter in color. And that is from the tannic acid that's leaching out of the trees and into the water. All right, everyone, so here we see we've got a green frog in the bog water here. He's letting me get pretty close to him, which is kind of awesome. Um, and I know that this is a green frog because he has that dorsal lateral ridge, which is that line that runs from behind its eye down its back. And also that round circle there behind the eye, that's called the tympanum. Uh, it's closer to the eye on the green frog than it is the bullfrog. So they look very, very similar. It can be really hard to tell them apart. Um, but this guy here we know is a green frog. So it's a pretty cool find here in the bog. Here in the bog, we just found some, or a nice big patch of blue beaded lily. Unfortunately, none of it is currently blooming, but if it were, out of the middle of these leaves, you would get a tall stalk with yellow bell-shaped flower that would then turn into blue berries, not edible. And next to it, Heather is going to talk about its friend. Gold thread, aka canker root. Uh, scientific name is Coptis trifolia. And this is called commonly gold thread for the reason that if we were to look at a root, which I don't know. They are a little hard to get out. It's very thready. <laughs> yeah, they're very <laughs> slender. Let's see if we can at least get a part of Is that part of one? Ah. Oh, it's pretty golden. Yeah, so um, they have these long, slender, golden or orange, yellow. Uh, roots that contain berberine and berberine is um, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, hepatic, so therefore uh, acts on the liver. Um, so if any of you have ever heard of golden seal, which is a popular supplement, uh, gold thread or canker root has the same exact chemical constituent. Um, and is actually much more commonly found than golden seal. Um, also called canker root because the root was used to be chewed uh, to take care of sores in the mm. mouth. All right, so I'm gonna try to get a little bit closer, but he's already spotted me and started to go away. But just here, we see a garter snake. Oh, there's his head, yeah. Now snakes get, I think, an undeservedly bad reputation. Uh, people are really, really afraid of them, even though the vast majority of snakes that we have uh, in this area are completely harmless to people. This guy in particular is one of those snakes that is harmless. 
I'm not going to try to touch them or pick them up, uh, mostly because they're super fast, like you just saw. They're going to get away. Um, but the other reason is because garter snakes in particular, when they are frightened, they release a musk, which basically is uh, like feces. It's sticky. It smells absolutely horrible. So you want to avoid picking animals up to stress them out um, because sometimes their defense mechanism is not to bite you or to hurt you, uh, but is to do something that smells very bad. So that's our garter snake. So this is our best specimen of the purple pitcher plant or Saracenia purpurea. It's the only northeastern uh, pitcher plant, so it's very easy to tell. What's unique about this plant is that it's carnivorous, mm. uh, which is a very interesting evolutional adaptation. And what it's decided to do is plants need energy and nutrients. And so for energy, it's getting sunlight and for nutrients, it can grow in these very nitrogen poor environments because it's deriving its nitrogen from insects. Insects fall into these little pitfall traps. There's downward facing hairs that prevent them from coming up. They drown in the rainwater, and then there's mutualistic species that live inside the water that help break down uh, the plant, uh, the insect for the plant. These are actually rolled leaves. That's the adaptation, but by rolling its leaf, it made it less efficient for photosynthesis. So they need high light environments or they would not survive because this is not the optimal position for a leaf to be mm. rolled and facing backwards. Mm -hmm. And so when these areas get covered over by trees, this PC dies out because it needs that amount of intense sight light to survive. And so these stalks that we're seeing, that's going to be a flower, you said? Yep, that's a flower that comes around the first week of June here in the Long Swamp easement. And of course, you'll notice the purple veins in the flower, in, in the leaves, um, hence the name purple pitcher plant. And I think also many flowers that have that purple color, that purplish reddish color, will also have a very um, rotting carcass smell to them they and do. that would attract the flies that as you said then fall prey to the carnivorous leaves and end up down in the drink that's right they use nectar bribes as well and that's what draws all the insects so if you look down any one of these you'd see a couple drowned insects ready to be uh, broken down and absorbed from the plant mostly for their nitrogen very cool it says there's also medicinal purpose yeah. to pitcher plants. Tell us about that. So historically, um, the Native Americans did use it as a treatment for smallpox. Wow. Um, there is no evidence that it was effective, mm. um, but this was a plant they called upon for that. Hmm. Um, also, uh, cold leaf infusion was used for whooping cough. Interesting. And also a hot infusion of the leaves for fevers and chills. Yeah. Um, not a plant that I would ever consider using modern day for medicinal purposes because it's far too unique um, and there's so many other plants we can choose from. But uh, interesting that yep. it was used historically that way. This is tamarack, also known as larch. Uh, scientific name is Larix larcinia. This is a very unusual tree, a very unusual member of the pine family. Uh, it is a deciduous evergreen. What does that mean? <laughs> so a deciduous evergreen uh, means that this tree come autumn, like our other deciduous trees, maple, oak, um, will its needles will turn bright yellow they'll change color and drop off hmm. um, and then it will put on new needles again so all, spring. all we'll be left with are these little nubs sticking out of the branch mm -hmm. so that tree is not dead when uh. you find it that way um, it simply lost its needles and were there any uses for this tree uh, medicinally so nearly every part of this tree has been used medicinally um, the needles, the outer bark, the inner bark, uh, the resin. Uh, the properties are considered to be astringent, so that would be like an anti-inflammatory property. Uh, antibacterial, diuretic, uh, and also laxative in some mm -hmm. cases, so keep that in mind. <laughs> um, but a lot of the pines share those same medicinal properties. Um, not so much the laxative property, so that is unique to tamarack.
Here is our common pitch pine. Kate, would you like to explain the common yeah, of course. pitch pine? So the pitch pine is a really neat tree. Uh, like Amanda said, it's not the most common of the pine species around here. It prefers really dry soil. Um, but the way that you can tell a pitch pine from our other pines is that there are three needles. And I like to remember it's a pitch pine as a baseball fan. You've got one, two, three strikes. You got your three nice. needles. And uh, if we look at the cones here, the cones of the pitch pine are really interesting because some of them only open when they're exposed to fire. So that's called a serotonous pine cone versus your other cones that open up naturally um, and then drop their seeds. But another way that you can tell the pitch pine is that these cones are really spiky. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but they've got a really sharp needle-like mm -hmm. point on the scale there. It's fine on the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that is our pitch pine. And like Kate said, it is a serotonous species. So if fire burns the bark, it can actually sprout anywhere along the trunk or the branches. And I've even seen sprouts coming out of a pine cone because the small twigs can sprout anywhere. So it is a fire adapted species and that's what we mean by serotonous. What did you find? Chicken of the woods. Oh my goodness, it's giant. <laughs> yeah, so this is a beautiful chicken of the woods. Um, really at its prime edibility. Um, this is a shelf mushroom. Uh, does not have any gills. And in fact, uh, most of our edible mushrooms do not have gills. So if you see a gilled mushroom, it is more likely than not in the wild that it is inedible. Um, so this is perfectly safe for consumption when cooked. You always want to cook your wild mushrooms. You never want to eat them raw. Um, and I wouldn't say it tastes like chicken, <laughs> but it is hearty. Um, really good sauteed and used in a stir fry or pasta, however you like to have your shrooms. Nice. Action. So the geology of Pike County here in northeastern PA is really composed of three essential components. There's the original deposition of the rock, it's its burial and consolidation and uplift, and then the erosional forces that form the landscape that you've seen today. So the rocks that you see here um, were formed 375 million years ago in the Devonian period, and they're essentially gray, medium to fine-grained sandstones that formed in an enormous delta river system, as I said, 375 million years ago, when this part of the continent was actually near the equator. And just to the east of here, all of these sediments came from mountains that are as high as the Alps are today. Uh, and those mountains are now long gone. That's where New Jersey now sits. Now, of course, after deposition, these rocks were buried, pressurized, heated, and then consolidated, and then upthrust about 260 million years ago to form the Pocono Mountains. Now, despite the great age of the rocks and the ancient deposition, the landscape that you see around you is really young geologically formed during the Wisconsin glacial episode. Had you been here 25,000 years ago, you would have been under a thousand feet of ice, deep enough to bury the Statue of Liberty three times over. And when that ice retreated 11,700 years ago, it left two parallel valleys where Nitroconk Lake and Long Swamp now exist, and then left everywhere else this accumulation of silt, clay, and boulders called glacial till all locally derived rock that the glacier tore up on both its advance and its retreat. And of course, this is the landscape now. These soils are less than 10,000 years old. This is the plant communities that we have adapted to this thin soil, as you saw in the bog and as you see here, trees in a dry oak heath environment that could subsist on really narrow soils and very rocky terrain. All right, everybody, we are getting ready to head out of the woods here, but thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you had fun and learned something new. Thank Bye. You.